the, the eating situation. It was rice for breakfast, lunch and dinner, you know. And ants as well. I don't know how many ants I ate. Oh, they, yes. they crawl in your food and it be, the red ones had protein, so I didn't really mind them. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. The childhood was a normal one, really. I was brought up um, myself. I had a, I've got a brother and a sister. We was quite poor, sort of, back in the day. Um, my mum and dad worked very hard, obviously, to do what they could for us. I was a bit naughty, um, nothing too major, you know. Just get up to the odd things here and there, you know. It's sort of always out about on the streets and things, not like the kids these days. From education, went into employment. Uh, I was in a factory for like 10 years. Um, I stayed there basically because my son was born when I was 17. Uh, I had my one and only child. Uh, when did you first visit India? Uh, my first occasion was 2001. Um, I went over with my then girlfriend and, like I say, I, I loved the country. Um, Goa especially, you know, the beaches and the people, the food and how, how cheap it was, basically. Uh, so, from 2001, I visited virtually every year, at least once, once a year. In 2006, myself and um, my mum my and uh, my stepfather went over at the time, and my son, uh, 2006. So we seen um, you could buy apartments there quite cheap. So we was going there once a year. I thought, you know, eventually maybe we can have like four or five weeks out there, stay in our own sort of place, etc. And It was around November 2006. It was in the, the Christmas time, actually. It was December time. Um, I was there with my then girlfriend and a, a so-called friend was there with his girlfriend. Um, basically, I wanted to send some gifts home. There's a, um, there's a market on a Wednesday, it's called Anjuna Market. Uh, the year before, I actually bought a, a, a statue of a Buddha and uh, an elephant, like they were wooden. And they were quite heavy. So we went to the airport and they charged me like over a hundred pounds, you know, excess baggage. So. This year, anyway, I was going to do the same type of thing and this friend had said, no, I can get him to the post office. He took my details, I filled out some forms where I was staying, etc. copies of my passport. Come home, 2000, um, it was 2005 going into six, and 2006, sort of January, he approached me saying, where's, you know, where's your, your gifts, sort of thing, what I'd posted, and I was like, well, I've not received them. Again, over the following few weeks, I found out that he put diazepam tablets within the boxes. Now, to my knowledge, he put a few strips, you know, he'd mixed them with the boxes. They've been seized. Now, ironically, I went back in the March to the same hotel where we declared I was staying. And I was handed over um, from them a letter, basically, I read it. It was from the customs in Mumbai. And it said, we've seized some boxes. Um, and basically, they'd been misdeclared inside these goods, was declared, you know, what I had sent, but it contains the Azipam tablets, um, which is a Schedule H drug. Now, if you want to claim the tablets back, you have to come to Mumbai, which is like three hour flight, 12 hour drive, whatever else. You need a proof of purchase and you need a medicinal license, which was the ma main thing. And you can actually take them and export these. So. I ripped the paper up thinking nothing of it. You know, it's he's obviously cheated me, he's put these in. And unbeknownst to me, there was an LOC, which is a lookout circular in my name in all Indian airports to arrest me. Now, I was arrested, I was took to the court the next day. Um, in India, you don't um, you don't have a lawyer until you've, you've filled out um, your statement and everything else. So, you know, you, you're sort of guilty until proven innocent, right, the other way around. So, but I didn't get physically beaten. I got a couple of slaps off them and, you know, they'd actually found, when they was reading through the paperwork, they said the first box contained 22,000 and something diazepam tablets, 2,000 and so many strips. So straight away, straight away, I was like, you know, shocked. I didn't realize there'd be so many. And I knew there was paperwork for three boxes. So, you know, doing, doing the maths, I knew there was quite a large number. It was produced in the court 
And then the following day, I was took um, to the jail, basically in Mumbai called Arthur Road. And uh, that's where the nightmare sort of began. The first three years, eight months, it was just, it was the first year anyway was hell. Um, you go into this prison, you know, and it's like a barrack system. These are different sort of two structure barracks. Uh, it was run from the uh, the Raj, basically, when, in it, you know, India was ruled by Britain, a history lesson back in the day. So it was built for the Indian prisoners. Um, and it was just a stone rectangular structure. There was, you know, there was concrete missing everywhere. And it was just dirty. There was, uh, the first barrack was put in was made for 80 men. And there was actually 220 men in there. Uh, we're all like sardines, you know, lay on the floor. It's what you see with your plastic bag with your belongings, your washing line and the whirring fans everywhere. So, yeah, uh, to adjust for the first year especially was really hard, you know. Um, obviously, it's a different culture, different language, so you have to learn body language more. Um, the, the eating situation, it was rice for breakfast, lunch and dinner, you know. And ants as well. I don't know how many ants I ate. Oh, they, yes. they crawl in your food, and it be, the red ones had protein, so I didn't really mind them. <laughs> them but oh yeah, yeah. Rats. Wow. There was loads of rats as well. The rats used to scare the cats because they were bigger. Uh, so the cats just used to look at and walk off, and that they didn't even bother with them. Didn't help. I got malaria five times within like over a period of eight months in 2010. Um, and they took me to the hospital wing and I finally had a bed and I thought fantastic you know after all these months I've got a bed and then I looked at the mattress it was only so thick you know it wasn't very uh, big but I looked at the mattress and it was so many stains on it and things crawling and it was just disgusting you know it wasn't a hospital it was just it was I just at that point that was sort of my, one of my lowest points being in there of the total um, time I served. Where was that first prison you were sent to? That was called Arthur Road. Basically what happened was I was put in there 2009 in the November. Um, after a, two or three months later I was I was getting angry all the time. I was you know I went in with the impression that you know this is jail you've got to fight everyone and but it wasn't really like that because there's not much to fight over. There was a black and white TV and they'd only have one channel, so you can't argue over the channels. But the only sort of fighting I would see was with the water situation. Every morning you'd, you'd have a trough with the water running from the pipe. Uh, the poorer people have the pots where they eat the food from. Now they'd use that to bathe as well, so there'd be 10 pots fighting for the water in the pipe and next minute someone would get one on their head and he'd get one on his head. and. You know, it was, it was amusing for the first couple of weeks, but then after a while, it's so, it's so grating, you know, and you you know, every day you need, you, you want that peace and you just can't get the peace because there's so many sea of humanity. So, yes, yeah, so I was in the barrack uh, for a few months. The superintendent then called me out because uh, I just wasn't coping really. Um, <clears throat> I expected to be out, my lawyer told me, wait 60 days you'll be out and the 60 days was just like wow it's two months you know I can't do 60 days but I managed to get through the 60 they extended it to 90 the prosecution then they extended it again to 180 days which is a lot they're allowed to do before your trial even sort of commences so basically I was under trial um, that's when they done the extra investigation they had like 15 witnesses they pulling witnesses out of nowhere sort of um, the post office lady and the, the people are from the hotel and they have all these different witnesses. Were you pleading innocence at this time? Yes, of course. Um, <clears throat> um, but you, the problem with India, the judicial system is so slow. There was always sort of light at the end of the tunnel until it got shut off again. But um, there was sort of always something. And come to the three month, obviously, I was expecting to go and I was just sort of getting angry with people and superintendent said to me, right, we're going to put you in a, it's an option, but it's called Andabarak. Now, it, in Hindi, it basically means a prison within a prison. So it was a, a circular stone structure built within the prison. And at the time it was holding um, a guy called Ajmal Kassab. 
He was the lone surviving terrorist from uh, Pakistan. They attacked Mumbai in 2008. There's a lot of films and stuff about it. And they actually built him a bomb-proof uh, jail within the jail. So he got transferred to there and they actually made a court underneath the jail, uh, underneath the prison for just for him to so go every day for his uh, hearing. Obviously, he was found guilty. One morning, they whisked him out to the Pune jail where they'd stayed in Yerawada uh, and hung him there. You don't meet these sort of people every day, you know, but I met Bollywood stars in there. I met sort of big, big, very big gangsters. And because they was obviously kept separate, it was a high security, if you like, area. But that high security had 24 hour running water. So to me, that was, that was like the best thing you can get in the prison, you know, to have access to water 24 hours rather than store it in the morning and then store it in the evening, you know. And were you frightened of these other men? I mean, for the first few months, I was terrified. Um, not, not of the people itself, but of the situation, um, the conditions, the... It was, everything was alien to me, you know. People would stare at me. See, India is such a huge, diverse country. Um, you've got village people that have never seen a white person or, you know, some people would be touching me tattoos and going, what are you doing? And, you know, getting very angry. And But they were basically, they'd not seen that. They don't have electricity, running water. They have nothing, these people, you know. So to adjust to that, them sort of situations as well was quite hard to understand that. And do the other prisoners treat you well, considering you're a foreigner? Um, they did, being a British. And also, the more white you are, the more respect you get. After a year, uh, it, was, it was about 2011 actually, somebody came, they was extradited from Thailand. Uh, it was a gangster from the 90s called Santos Shetta. He was brought in, uh, speaks very good English, we've become very good friends. We ended up staying together in the same cell. And I got, for, for two years, I sort of lived like a king, if you can call it that, in the jail, you know. Everybody knew me because of him and, I'd go to court and the guards had let me wander around for a few hours because of him, could bring things in, you know, so life was sort of okay at that point. Okay as can be, considering the situation, you know. I had a good friend that lost his mind, you know. You realise it's a very fine line between sanity and insanity when he was a very educated man and then one day, you know, he got 15 years sentence and then a couple of years down the line, he, he's gone, he's not in the gate, trying to get out and you know, so I was sentenced on July the 5th, 2013 and the judge sentenced me to 20 years for export of these 75,100 tablets. Now, everybody was saying throughout, you know, there's, there's no evidence on you, they've got no, there's, there's nothing, there's no possession or anything basically, it, but it's your handwriting which I, I admitted, I've filled out the forms. Um, but well, that was all they had. Everyone appeals, obviously, once they're convicted, the majority, and they're waiting. They might wait 10 years, and they've already served the sentence anyway. So I've been transferred from Mumbai to a place called Kolhapur, nearer to Goa in the south. Uh, that was where I had to spend my conviction while I was sort of waiting for the trial to finish in the High Court. So my trial took, like I say, ironically, exactly six years. I was convicted on the 5th of July 2013 and acquitted the 5th of July 2019. I say that that's when the judge gave her a decision. It was a lady judge um, in the High Court. Now, the arguments, i.e. Uh, from the prosecution and the defence in the High Court took place over a couple of months in the January and February. Basically, by, by March, everything had um, finished. And then it took till July to give the decision. So that was another one of the hardest times it was the last three months sort of waiting every day for your name, you know, to be, to say you're either going or you, you, you're staying, you know, you're convicted or you, you're acquitted. And how was your, your final day in prison? The 5th of July was a Wednesday. Now the superintendent called me to the office. I was like, please give me the decision. I walked in the office and he stood up with his hand out. He went, about it, I'm pleased to say it. And then it was just sort of, it was a relief, you know, 
It was like, finally. Luckily for me, I didn't know at the time, but the judge passed the order where she was acquitting me uh, that I had to be deported from the country within 10 days. Now, there was a bit of, there was a up in arms on this. Nobody really knew what was going on with this 10 days. So the uh, superintendent said, I'm going to contact the Mumbai Customs. They're going to come and put you in a detention centre and then they're going to send you home via the plane. So come to the Thursday, still nothing had happened. I was saying, what's going on? Oh, we still don't know. And comes to the Friday. Now, by the Friday afternoon, obviously I'm packed. I'm ready to go. I want to get out there. So what I've stormed in the office and I've said, I call him Saab, I said, Saab, I said, I'm a free man. I said, why am I still here? He said, well, yeah. I said, so technically if I walk out there now, I said, tell your guards on that tower, they better not be shooting me because I'm a free. So he said, so luckily he done me a favor. He got one of the guards from the prison, it was quite surreal really, to come up to Mumbai with me. Um, I had to do paperwork in Mumbai, you see. I managed to get home on the Sunday via a direct flight to Heathrow. Getting back into the UK and having to rebuild your life, what, how, like, did you have a plan? Or? Um, well, for six months, I was still, like I say, I still sort of had the, um, the Indian philosophy within me, and I've, I've been doing yoga so much, and I was very calm, I was a very calm person. Um, I wasn't wearing designer clothes, but within six months, you're back in society, and I was having road rage again and I'm wearing designer clothes. So it was just sort of one of them, you know. But at the time I thought I was normal. Uh, looking back now, I'd say I wasn't myself for 12 months. You know, it's like a university of life and you'd appreciate everything more, you know. I could, I'll sit on the toilet an extra five minutes because I can. I don't have to squat <laughs> anymore, for example. You know, just switching a light off and you're more thankful for everything. Um, and you never know what's around the corner, you know, so I make sure every day, I make sure I uh, enjoy every day and don't, don't let it get away. Here's a pack of pills, sell them to the tourists in the clubs. You know, you can use, you can, you can, you can pay us what you need to and, and, and life can be a little bit better for you. And when they raided my room, the police, they were looking around, they were like, is this like a Rambo movie, what's going on here?